today, uh, if you read the papers very much, uh, you probably have seen that we've got a, uh, some declining revenues in the state of Georgia and everywhere else in the country, uh, and a very difficult budget situation. Thank goodness, because of the good leadership we've had over many years in Georgia and fiscal conservativeness, we're not in the st situation that California, Illinois, and New York find themselves in. But it is very difficult. And uh, I know Senator Hill and, and Dr. Bordeaux have been working tirelessly on the budget. There are a lot of good ideas being talked about, how we can reduce the cost of state government and protect essential services. And our speaker today is one of the experts in the country uh, in that area. Uh, Leonard Gilroy is the Director of Government Reform at the Reason Foundation. He is a certified urban planner who works on privatization, government reform, transportation, infrastructure, and urban policy issues. Listen to the areas where he specializes. Public-private partnerships, competition, government efficiency, transparency, accountability, and government performance. Everything we're focusing on in Georgia, so he can be a tremendous resource. He has advised elected officials around the country, most recently Governor Bobby Jindal in Louisiana, and some innovative things that they're doing down there, I'm sure he'll tell you about today. He is the editor of the world's most respected newsletter on privatization, Privatization Watch. Um, you want to know what's going on around the country at either the state, federal, or local level, he's tracking it. They also produce at the Reason Foundation the annual privatization report, which is a wonderful resource. Before joining Reason, he was a senior planner at a New Orleans-based urban planning consulting firm, and he received his uh, undergraduate and master's degree at Virginia Tech. And uh, I guess, Lynn, you know, since Georgia Tech beat Virginia Tech and they weren't able to go to the Virginia Tech, to the ACC championship this year, at least the Saints are in the Super Bowl. So, please welcome Leonard Gilroy. Thank you, thank you. It's a it's a honor and a privilege to be here today, uh, and it's just I'm honored to be able to come and, and you know in my small way support the work of, of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and in all the work that uh, Rogers and Kelly and Benito are doing out there here in this state. Um, I see a lot of think tanks around the country, and I work with a lot of them. And uh, I have to say that I I consistently always rank Georgia among the top of the the people that I enjoy working with. Um, so thank you for having me. So uh, yeah, we've got some budget issues today, don't we? Uh, we've got some fiscal challenges across the country. Certainly anybody, as Kelly said, anybody watching the paper, you cannot avoid it. Um, the good news, or uh, let me start it this way. The bad news is there's no good, easy solution for doing this. Um, the good news is there are lots of different approaches that places are taking and have taken in the past that if you aggregate them together and you know look at a more comprehensive approach, you could actually make a make a dent or you know if not make a dent and uh, uh, get rid of the, the uh, deficits and your your problems entirely, or at least set yourselves up for a, a, a more uh, sustainable approach to to budgeting and and to your uh, you know to your approach to fiscal issues uh, for the future. And there's so this is. I think Rahm Emanuel, you know the the whole quote about uh, cri uh, don't let a good don't let a good crisis go to waste. Um, that's I think absolutely correct in this as we talk about budgets because right now, uh, for those of us interested in limited government and free markets, um, these are challenging times. But we also stand at the precipice of a huge opportunity. Um, when a state like California, I mean, the, the, you know, we're in Georgia. You're talking what a billion and a half is that the current number? Billion and a half budget deficit, and that's that sounds bad. It sounds terrible. You know, unfortunately, that's not so bad off relative to the other states. Um, where I live in Arizona, uh, uh, been out there for a couple years now. We're, we, our revenues are down 40 percent this year. 40. I mean, that's a whopping statistic, and there's no easy tinkering. Uh, you know, you can you can do all the sort of market-based reforms you want, but there are, you know, th just given the nature of budgets and spending, protected spending categories, it becomes very difficult to cut 40% out of your budget, but that's where we are today. So what that says for those of us interested in, in, in limited government and in, in, in supporting free markets is that we have an opportunity. This is it. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. Um, you don't get these sorts of opportunities to really go in and take a big look. Um, because in this mode of crisis, th that's what we have the opportunity to do. So luckily, there are, I mean, the, the reality is that unlike the federal government, where you can just print your own money, uh, states actually have to live within their means 
sort of. Um, you know, we, uh, every state has a balanced budget requirement, so technically speaking, you have to have a balanced budget at the end of the day. Now, anybody familiar with budgets and the way state government works knows that that, that you know, you can use all sorts of gimmicks and trickery to, 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 to make that budget balance. But the reality is that you can only do that, do the trickery so long before it catches up to you. And California is a great example. Um, last year in February, they closed a $26 billion budget deficit. $26 billion. I mean, that sta some states don't have a budget that size. That was in February. Then by like the summer, they had another, I think it was about the same size. It was 20 to $25 billion, a new one that opened up, a new budget deficit. They had to close that. Lots of gimmickry, lots of accounting gimmicks, lots of you know, trickery. Um, well, now they're back again, and it's another 20, 30 billion that they're looking at this year. And so at some point, you can't perpetuate that cycle. You can only do that so long before you actually have to make cuts. And that's where even a state as dysfunctional as California is today. And so if we can start making some progress in places like California, New York, uh, Illinois is another good example. New Jersey is another good example. Um, if we can start making progress, and we're starting to see hints that there's progress there, um, then we can certainly do it everywhere. So let me um, let me walk you through. I was trying to think of a way to you know kind of tee this up. I mean, it's all, it's sort of a sad issue when you think about it. You know, we uh, we elect people to office to take care of you know the the sort of state purse, so to speak. And you know, when we it's it's sort of disillusioning when you look back and you see where we are and how uh, you know the, we don't get the kind of leadership we often need. So I was trying to think about you know in that kind of context, how could you start off with something funny? And then I, I was at the airport last night and uh, I found this issue of The Economist. And if you guys go to a you know, bookstore or something, pick this up. It's a good read. This is the backlash against big government. It's the current cover of The Economist. And I thought that picture sort of encapsulates where we are today. You know, that, you know, you could call it Leviathan, you could call it the state, you can call it, you know, a lot of different names. But, you know, I think when lots of us on the free market side of things tend to think about government, and if you could put it into a creature, that's probably a lot of what it would look like. And, of course, the little guy dangling is you, um, being consumed by the, uh, the Leviathan of big government. But, you know, that, this is, if you have the economists talking about the backlash against big government, and, yeah, I mean, they were using the Massachusetts uh, victory last week, uh, Scott Brown, to kind of, you know, tag off and, and lead into a discussion of the global attempts to rein in big government, even in places across the spectrum in Europe and, uh, in, in, you know, lots of countries overseas, where it's not just us, we're not, and it's not just the states in the U.S., it's everywhere around the world that's going, that's kind of stepping back and saying, guys, we, here's where we are, but this is not a sustainable path, what are we going to do about it? So we have a couple of challenges today in government, and there's two, I mean, there's lots of problems in government, but I'll just pick, you know, a couple here as it relates to spending. You have two big problems. You have what I call autopilot budgeting, which is basically, it's the assumption that, you know, the dollar you spent last year was a good dollar spent, so next year, let's spend that amount plus a little bit more to account for inflation. And that's basically what lots of states and local governments do. That's the way they budget. Well, that, you know, is that once you get on autopilot, uh, you know, it's hard to get off. Um, that's something that has to change. Also underneath that, um, you also have this no market test, uh, monopoly service provision. That's a fancy way for saying, um, and I, I kind of note it down lower, the public option as a first option. If there's a problem, oftentimes in, in public policy and in government, the first solution is, well, government should do something about that. And then the idea is, well, let's design something so that government can do something about that. And we don't step back and really think, well, what's the problem? A, what's the problem we're trying to solve? B, is this the tool to do it? And uh, you know, are there other approaches that would get you to the same goal? Um, typically, there's sort of this automatic knee-jerk default to government should do this. Um, once you throw those two things together, you get a recipe for out-of-control spending, and that's where we are. Um, I mentioned that Arizona's uh, revenues are down 40 percent. They've probably, over the last five to ten years, they probably have increased that much, excuse me, spending has about increased about that much as well. So what was happening in Arizona was we were, you know, we were having sort of a, 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 an illusory um, economic boom in the housing market. Lots of places being built, lots of homes being built, not quite enough people to move into them, and then when the economy crashed, um, you know, the, uh, the revenues went with it. But um, while that money was coming in initially, we were spending it. We were spending it left and right. So now our budget inflated tremendously. Now we're back down to a reality check. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the way these things tend to work. 
Also, you know, other problems. Obviously, it's easy to propose a spending, you know, program, a new new spending initiative. Um, but cutting it, try it. You know, try to go up there and and be the guy to champion cutting spending, especially in a protected or or, or you know maybe one of these. Um, uh, you know, something like education or, or, or health care, something that is perceived as, uh, you know, uh, sort of a sanctuary for, for public spending, um, try cutting, proposing cuts there and you're going to see what kind of reaction you get. Um, also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, policy making tends to be ready, fire, aim in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I think the, what we've seen, uh, what we've seen, the federal response to the the financial crisis, the stimulus, the bailouts, all that stuff is sort of a, you know, one way to, to think about that, the ready, fire, aim nature. But really, I think what, you know, the, the problem is, is that policymakers need to recognize that there's more tools available than they're actually using. Um, and when the, you know, this is a common, uh, you know, everybody knows this statement, but, you know, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Every problem starts to look like a nail. Well, I, my suggestion is get a new toolbox. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to break this down into, you know, more simple language. I was trying to think about how to take this down from the wonky uh, level to, to something that people would understand. And it always, it never surprises me how, um, in discussing these issues, kitchen table, econo kitchen table economics always seems to be a relevant thing underneath in, in terms of how to, 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 to talk about, you know, the problems that we have in government. People understand kitchen table economics. If you uh, say your spouse maybe loses a job or takes a pay cut, well, you, you know, what do you do? You, you know, there's f a few things that you do, and these are them. You budget smarter. You, well, how can I maximize, on the, on the lev lower revenue I have coming in, how can I maximize the efficiency of those dollars? You could call that bang for the buck. Um, spend less money, obviously. If I've got less money coming in, then I need to spend less money. And then stop digging the hole deeper. So don't go out and max up your credit card, you know, et cetera. Those are rules that every family goes through at some point. And, you know, you, you, it's the ways that we address this in our family are really shouldn't be thought of as that different from the ways that we might address it in government. So what I wanted to do is take these sort of three broad categories. And there's, you know, um, there's more. I mean, this is, I just wanted to keep it, uh, keep it relatively simple here. Um, but I'm going to go through each of these three categories and, and list some strategies and talk about some strategies in government and how to make that happen. So let's start with budgeting. Um, what you might call this here is like, a, and you know, some, Georgia has some of this, other states have different pieces of this. But what you're seeing here is this is really kind of a toolbox of sustainable budgeting. You obviously need a balanced budget requirement. I mean, that's a, you know, sort of a basic, and, and most states require that. In fact, I think every state has that in their constitution. Um, spending limitations and rainy day accounts. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, you've heard of probably Tabor, Taxpayer Bill of Rights, you know, or tax and spending limitations. But that, that, that idea, the idea that in the good times when the revenues are coming in, we should take some of it off to save for a rainy day and then give the rest back to taxpayers, um, that's an idea that has not gotten the attention that it deserves. And, uh, you know, you've had a couple of states that have, that have made some moves in that direction and some local governments. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to get very serious about um, in terms of making sure that you have automatic means of, 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 of adjusting to, to fluctuating um, budgets. And, and saving in the, in the good times for the bad times. I mean, that's the problem we had in Arizona. We didn't save any of it. Uh, revenues start pouring in, spend it all, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the economy comes back down to reality. We're left 40% short in our revenues. Um, another one here, the nonpartisan revenue forecast. This is sort of a wonky way of saying you need a third party outside check. Uh, on the revenues. Because a lot of times what happens is that, you know, obviously as policymakers, um, the incentive is to have a rosy, optimistic budget. We're going to assume the best for the revenues, and we're going to assume the, the, you know, the best in spending, and, you know, and that's what we're going to pitch as a budget. It doesn't matter if that's, if, if that's fantasy, um, but that's how the budgeting process typically works. Well, places like Texas, Texas is a great example of this. In their constitution, Texas has a, they have something called a comptroller of public accounts. Um, you could sort of think of it as uh, you know, a CFO kind of position for the state, so to speak. Or, or a state accountant. Um, that state uh, comptroller has, under the Constitution, the ability to, to, they review the budget, you know, before it gets passed. And if they look and they say, look, revenues are not coming in anywhere near what you guys are saying it's going to be, they can send it back to the legislature and send it back to the legislature and get them to, you know, make it, uh, you know, have it conform to the economic reality and the revenues of reality. 
and the certification of the budget is the seal of approval that they put on it at the end of the day when it looks like the revenues are you know aligned with reality. That's a, that's a simple, simple thing. And Texas was, had the foresight to put that in their constitution, but I don't think, I can't remember or recall any other state that has anything like that. And so that is something that I think more states should be looking at, is having an outside check, you know, an auditor, an accountant, whatever you want to call it, but doing a check on the budget, not on going back afterwards and reviewing what happened, but doing it up front and not letting it go forward unless it, you, you have something that's realistic. Whoops. Um, and I'm going to come back to outcome-based budgeting in a second because I have a slide on that. So let me skip ahead. Performance measurement and management, you know, you, you'd think that with the ubiquitous nature of performance measurement in the, the corporate sector, in the private sector, that this would be a common thing in government. And unfortunately, it's not. This is, um, you know, and there are some states, some states, some local governments do better than others. And there are lots of people that spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we measure things in government? How do we measure what we're trying to achieve? How do we measure what you know, if we've achieved them. Those are difficult questions, whether it's public sector, private sector. Um, and this is sort of a, you know, even though the idea of performance measurement in government has been around forever, it's still, I would say, an emerging kind of area of focus in uh, public administration. And that's something that we definitely need to be thinking about because you can't just spend money willy-nilly. You have to know if you're getting results for it. Otherwise, you're not really doing taxpayers, the, you know, the justice that they deserve. Um, the last couple of things are a couple of pieces here. I mean, budget transparency, that, the, the, that should be obvious. I mean, we heard about the, the, uh, the online checkbook a, a few minutes ago. That's the kind of thing where, you know, that's, that's not going to save you much money necessarily, but what it does is it gives everybody the ability to go in and scour the budget and come up with ideas and give citizens, it's an empowering thing for citizens. Um, Requiring fiscal notes before action on spending bills, I mean, that's a simple thing. And lots of states and local governments do some version of that. Um, but, you know, if we're going to have a spending bill, you, you better be sure you know what, it's gonna, what that's going to cost before you approve it. And then also I think it's helpful to have a budget timeout so that from the moment, you know, you've got the, a budget introduced or before it's amended or passed, you've got, you know, 72 hours at least before, you know, before it's introduced, before you either amend it or approve it to, um, well, first of all, I mean, I think citizens need the time to review and understand the, the trade-offs and the choices. But then also, I think policymakers, it would be good to have that cool-down period um, before moving forward. Uh, and then if you, if you have the budget transparency, believe me, you're going to have people calling you as if you're a legislator or, or, or uh, you know, elected official, you're going to have people calling you saying, hey, why are you spending this? So it's, uh, you know, it's helpful to have those things as a package. These things, you can find bits and pieces all around, but Putting it in a, together will give you a sustainable approach to budgeting. And I want to go back to this um, outcome-based budgeting because that's something that is, I think, pretty important. You know, the way government usually works is that it doesn't really focus on outcomes so much. It usually focuses on inputs. How much are we spending? How many people have we employed? How many people used our service? Not did they get a good service? Did they get what they wanted? Did we serve them well? Um, and again, I mentioned earlier the assumption that last year's dollar was a good dollar spent. So with that kind of system, you're going to have bad spending decisions. Well, this sort of performance-based budgeting, or, or you know, this is sort of an offshoot of that outcome-based budgeting, which is really designed to link budget systems to fund outcomes. The idea being start not with what we have and then what we can afford. Let's start with what are we trying to achieve okay, in government? What are those priorities? What are the outcomes we as taxpayers and we as policymakers want to achieve? And then let's look at the spending to figure out how to afford those outcomes. And, you know, it's basically looking at, looking at what we're trying to achieve and then pricing it out. Um, and so essentially what you're doing is, you know, if, if you can integrate that into a budget process, and this isn't a fantasy. Um, there have been places that have, st Washington State, Iowa, uh, Louisiana now is getting into this, which is the idea that, um, Let's have, let's actually tie the budget to those outcomes. And then if we, if we not only measure performance, but, in, but integrate budget and performance together in the budgeting process, then what you have is a system where you can, over time, basically weed out the underperformers, weed out the underperforming programs, merge them, consolidate them, do whatever. But if you know what you're, how much you're spending for the outcomes you're getting, you have a much better tool for decision making. Um, Here's how this might look. This is from Washington State when they did this a few years ago under um, Governor Gary Locke. Um, 
what they did was they basically said, guys, we don't have all the money in the world, and you guys, taxpayers, you want lots of things, and we've promised you lots of things, but sorry, that's not going to happen. So let's figure out what those priorities are. And they literally did meetings around the state, had citizens come out and do the you know, dots on the board or you know, something like that, where you're basically saying, we're going to rank, you know, as you can imagine, healthcare, education, safety, those things rank very highly. Once you actually, and once you force people to basically make a choice, a you know, trade-off between healthcare and education and safety and all the other many, many things, then it starts, then you can start to get a prioritization. And what they essentially did was, you know, they went through, found the priorities, and that's what's sort of listed there. It's hard to read, but it's things like, you know, safety and economic development and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they ranked them. And then they basically said, guys, it's, you can think of it, think of uh, the top part of this line here. If you can have an inverted pyramid over it, so a pyramid that kind of comes down like that, we're going to, first priority of the revenues here, and we're going to fund down until we hit this line, which is where the revenues run out. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea. The idea is, guys, let's you know, recognize that there are trade-offs. Let's recognize it, which we don't do right now in government. Recognize their trade-offs. We'll engage you, the public, in the process of prioritizing it. And then you know, we'll fund down until we run out of money. That way, we know that we've hit the first things first. That's the idea here. And so, as I mentioned, Iowa, Washington State have, have done you know, their own versions of this. Um, and I don't think anybody's really pulled it off perfectly yet. Typically, the way, for instance, it works in Washington State is uh, the governor will come up with this in their budget. And even after this governor left, and he's now in DC, uh, that process has, has been retained at the, at, you know, in the governor's office in their budget, in the executive budget. But when that goes to the legislature, they don't have that, um, you know, they didn't embrace this approach, so you see the system sort of collapse there. They're getting better, they're, it's better than it would have been absent having the governor's executive budget framed like this, but still there's, you know, there's an there's a implementation gap that, you know, is I think the, the thing that has to be worked out to make this really, really uh, sizzle. So I'm gonna move on to the next category, um, spend less money. This, uh, you know, it sounds so obvious, but it, it's, if you look at uh, any headline, any day of any paper in any state capital, you're going to see how difficult it is to actually to spend less money. So first thing here, and look, I run our privatization program at Reason Foundation. We, we actually are credited with coining the term privatization as it relates to municipal government back in the, late, in the 70s. And uh, we wrote, actually wrote the first book um, on municipal privatization, basically making the argument that we could think outside the box for local governments. You could actually design a city that is entirely run by contract managers. And that was in 1979. That book ended up going and getting distilled down for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and you saw sort of what she did in the UK, kind of taking that idea. Um, so I, privatization is something near and dear to me. And actually, you know, it's kind of funny, just as an aside, it's funny that we wrote that book in 1979. And here, what, 40, uh, 30 years later, there are actually some cities here, not too far from here, that, are, that have embraced that model for the most part uh, outside of the public safety. But you have Sandy Springs and, and, uh, and uh, Johns Creek and Dunwoody uh, and a couple of other smaller cities um, that have essentially started up startup cities that have essentially privatized their entire city government outside of public safety. So the book that we wrote all those years ago, actually, you know, it's kind of neat to see it play out in real life. Um, anyway, privatization has to be on the plate. Georgia is actually a very good state in a lot of regards on, on, in various pieces of privatization. I'll mention a couple in a minute. But there is no state that has done this perfectly, and there's no state that couldn't stand a lot more. Um, so how do you do that, though? That's the question. And typically with privatization, um, the way it usually happens is that some policymaker comes up with an idea. Maybe they hear it from a lobbyist. Maybe they hear it from you know, their counterpart in another state. It could come from a lot of sources. But they'll say something like, hey, let's privatize. Uh, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a concrete example. In Arizona, um, somebody came up with the idea of let's monetize our prisons. Okay? Let's do like a, essentially what they wanted to do is pri privatize the prisons but get an upfront payment to close the budget. Now the private prison, nobody asked the private prison industry because when they looked at that they said, wait, we're not going to do that. But that's, that, that's a reality check that never happened because what happened was somebody came up with the idea, they got their staffer to write it, you know, it got put in a budget bill, and all of a sudden in the budget that gets passed is a thing to say, issue an RFP to privatize one or, one or all, one or more, you know, including all, of our state prisons with a $100 million upfront payment. You know, that got into the budget, that got scored in the budget, even though it, had, it was a fantasy, it was never gonna happen. And um, 
So why did that happen? Well, it's because there was no due diligence. There was no thought. It was you know, intu intuitive decision making is what I call it. It's as somebody gets an idea and says, hey, it's a good idea. Let's do it. And then you know, that can go south. That can go south in a lot of different ways. But even when, it's, when it does move forward, it may not necessarily be the right idea or the right approach. And no, you have, don't have a system for thinking about it. Well, the second, actually, there, the bullet, I somehow missed the bullet, but establish a state privatization competitive government commission. What that is, and I'll talk about that in a second a little bit more, but it's basically the lesson that we've learned from watching privatization work around the world. Um, and it's really what Margaret Thatcher started in the UK, which is recognizing that privatization's tricky. It's always going to be tricky. You're always going to have somebody screaming at you. It's going to be a public employee. It's going to be somebody fearing profit. It's going to be something like that. So you need to do, as a policymaker, if you're interested in privatization, you need to do your due diligence. And you need to do things like a business case. Does this make sense? Would we save money if we did do this? What would we do with the employees that we currently have? Think through all the what ifs and you know, possibilities. And what that, that sort of commission approach is the way that that is typically um, worked the best, is actually have a group that does that, that fills that sort of function. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Performance-based contracting is another one we, we you know, I'm a big, I'm a, I run our privatization program, I'm a big fan of privatization, but I'm the first to tell you that privatization can go well or it can go poorly. And oftentimes when it goes poorly, it has to do with the contract. And oftentimes when it's a problem with the contract, it has to do with, incentives being misaligned and a lack of performance or a lack of detailed expectations. And what I mean by that is saying, you know, instead of having sort of the, 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 the type of fixed cost contract where, you know, somebody comes in, gives you a low bid, and then comes back and does a change order later, that always happens. That happens in government. And it's not the private sector's fault that that happens. It's government's fault that they're contracting that way. What they should be doing is in embedding performance measures and outcomes in the contract and holding the, the, the contractor financially uh, accountable for meeting them. So, you know, a quick example would be, um, you know, say, uh, say, well, here, I'll give you a concrete example. Well, when Mitch Daniels in Indiana privatized the Indiana toll road a few years ago, the contract that went along with that, it's like hundreds of pages long. And if you looked at that, you know, 300 pages of that, roughly, were performance specifications that the contractor had to meet, including you have eight hours to remove roadkill from the road or else we will hold you financially, we can penalize you. When you put incentives like that into a contract, you're not getting change orders, you're not getting nickel and dimed. You know, you, it's just a thought, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's expertise and procurement is what's missing there. And so that's one of those areas in which I think every government at all levels needs really good procurement expertise to know how to do a good contract as opposed to just sort of your standard old routine contract. And believe me, in government, th everything is boilerplate contracts, RFPs, all that stuff is boilerplate. So there's sort of the standard way of doing business which has to be broken down because it doesn't work. Um, obviously, you know, you have to look at those, those things that you can eliminate and consolidate. I'm going to come back and talk about some of that um, as it's going on in Louisiana right now. Um, you know, and, that, and that's a difficult question, but you, know, you need to look at things like, for instance, do we have, look, here's, here's a story from Florida. Uh, when they started looking under, Je when Jeb Bush was governor there, they started looking at mail services. And they discovered, nobody had ever put this together before, but they figured out that they had 13 different mail contracts for their 13 different agencies. Everybody had a mail contract with the same contractor, Pitney Bowes. And then they looked at it, they were at all different rates. You know, somebody, one group, is, one division is getting a better deal than the other, et cetera. And so they had the, you know, brainstorm. And, you know, again, this is kitchen table economics 101. Brainstorm, hey, maybe we could consolidate that into one contract and get a better rate. Pitney Bowes said, absolutely. Instead of 13 contracts, we'd have one to manage. From the state's end, that's one contract to manage instead of 13. Um, so when you can bundle things and, and consolidate services, you know, and also that, that holds true for all sorts of back-end support functions. So accounting, payroll, IT, HR, you know, if you have an agency that is running its own payroll and you have an agency that's running its own accounting, that's a great place to start because you don't need every agency having its own system. That's duplication that doesn't need to happen. Um, and that kind of leads into the next, which is shared services, you know, and it kind of a similar idea, which is, you know, if we have things that are functions, that common functions spread across divisions, let's consolidate them. Um, you can do this at, you know, and, and even within an agency, you could do that. Uh, across agencies, you could do that, especially for like the back end support and things like that that I mentioned. 
And then even states are doing this. Um, I, I think it was Mississippi and Alabama uh, recently agreed to do a big joint state shared services deal where they share uh, in, in you know, a variety of different functions together to get to, to, for economies of scale. And actually, I think um, Michigan and another state I'm forgetting right now are, doing, are getting ready to do the same thing. <clears throat> so that's states that are coming together to do shared services. So that's something that is, um, it's, people in the private sector know that that's how things should work, shared services. We don't need 50 people doing the job that it takes two to do. But in government, again, it's sort of an emerging field. Um, but there's a lot of experience out there in shared services, and that's something that um, in good times and in bad you should be doing. Um, a couple of other shall make, I'll go through real quick. Gain sharing or employee incentives programs, that's the idea of, well, let's incentivize the, the public employees to save money. And how do we do that? Well, we let them keep a piece of whatever they save. And the way that if you mix, if you combine that with that performance or that outcome-based budgeting thing, what that might look like is, so you, you know, you have a budget of, uh, let's just say it's a million dollars, okay? Let's pick a number. A million dollars. And say you come through and you've only spent 900000 and you've got, you know, 100 left over. Well, let's let the agency keep like a little sliver of that, 5 10%. You see different, different places have done different sizes of numbers. Um, but some little incentive for them, and then they can bring that and they can keep that in their budget for next year as you go back through with the outcome-based budgeting and drop that number down. Um, what you want to do is get a system where if they're saving money, then you, you cap the baseline at that for the next year. Um, but if you give them a little incentive to get there, then, you know, it, it just keeps the, it's, it's all about incentives, and it keeps the incentives in the right place. Um, technology, we all know how technology, I won't go into that. I mean, you know, technology can make a lot of things more efficient, as we all know in our personal lives. Same thing in government, and, and George is doing a lot of different things on technology right now. Um, another one I like, and nobody's really kind of picked up on this yet, but... Um, Iowa has actually, you know, if you're very familiar, I'm sure, with charter schools. Um, some places, this actually came up in New Zealand back when they did a big government downsizing. But the idea is, well, let's not just use a charter idea for schools. Let's use a charter idea for agencies. And Iowa actually did some of this back in the 90s, which is, and I'll just I mean, I'll give you an example of how that might work. Instead of having a state, I mean, now this is going to sound like heresy, and it's going to sound crazy, but bear with me. Instead of having a state, I'll just pick one, a, a Department of Transportation, for instance. Maybe instead of, you know, you know the, and DOTs, perf some perform better than others, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not singling out DOTs. Um, but what about the idea of could we guarantee performance if we, instead of just having that as a dedicated state agency, we did a contract with that agency. And we could start it off with like a five-year contract. And you, we're going to, the state is going to contract with the Department of Transportation for five years to achieve these outcomes, right? So you set it up just as you would if you were going to be contracting with a private company, right? Here's the outcomes. Here's what we're going to pay you, you know, that, what used to be called your budget. Here's what we're going to pay you. And if at the end of that five years you don't live up to those terms, then we will outsource that function to someone else. Somebody else will compete it. And what it is, is the way to get competition. That's all it is. At, in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if public employees or private sector are actually providing something. It's the competitive, in terms of spending. I mean, philosophically, that's another issue. But in terms of spending, that doesn't matter. What matters is creating the incentives for competition. Competition works. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day who wins. What matters is that you create the competitive process. And when you're telling an agency, no longer are you going to be protected as a, you know, entity of government, we're going to turn you into a charter agency, you know, well, that, you've just changed, you've rearranged, you know, the entire uh, uh, game board by doing that. Um, and then I would say, you know, the other thing that we need to do is, like, actually get serious about applying the charter idea to the rest of our public school system. You know, the... Uh, and some of there, there are some states, uh, uh, Hawaii and Nevada, that are take, starting to take this approach. Uh, New York City, Baltimore, Oakland. Um, uh, I'm forgetting some of the other major jurisdictions that have also been moving in that direction. But essentially, they're pushing something called student-based budgeting, or, or also known as a weighted student formula. But it's essentially, the the basic nugget of it is you're de facto charterizing a school district. What you're essentially doing is 
turn it, you tie the money to the backs of the kids. So that, in that way, it would kind of work like a voucher type system. But I mean, just conceptually. Money to the backs of the kids and give principals autonomy, okay? Or, you know, so they can control their budgets. They can control the curriculum. They can control, you know, et cetera. If they want to turn themselves into a, you know, arts and, you know, whatever, arts and music school, Great. If they want to be the math and science, you know, uh, international standard school, great. Um, but if you can open up the rules, let these guys have the autonomy to spend the money, hire the people they want, as opposed to being dictated to by a central office, of, you know, the, the, um, the, the central office of the school district, well, you know, you start to change the incentives. And then, you know, what you do with that is uh, you, you essentially, you, you charter, you, you don't call it chartering the system because you're not. They're still public schools. But what you've done is you've essentially brought the same set of incentives to the public school system as you do to a charter school, which is we're going to let you hire the people you want. We'll let you pay what you want. We'll let you, you know, teach how you want. And that's, you know, if it, if it works there, then maybe we could incentivize, you know, the rest of the schools to step up and deliver like that. And in fact, this isn't a fantasy. New York City is the biggest one doing this right now, and it's been tremendously successful. Uh, Oakland, Oakland started doing this a few years ago. They were, right, they were always near the bottom of California public schools. Um, and now they're not at the top yet, but after a couple of year, years of implementation, the Oakland public school system has basically been the biggest gainer in achievement uh, since they started this. So while they're not at the top yet in terms of overall performance, they're the ones making the biggest strides because they've moved to that kind of system. Um, so anyway, I, I'll be glad to talk more about that. And we actually, we just um, wrote the first most comprehensive study of all these jurisdictions that are doing this. Uh, it's called the Weighted Student Formula Yearbook, and it's on our website. And I'll be glad to you know, give you the information on that afterwards. And then also we have to look at things like, you know, and corrections is another big piece of the budget. You know, and sentencing reform, I think, has to be here. Tough on crime doesn't work for budgets. Um, you know, it works politically, but it doesn't work for a budget. And I think most states are now really, you know, the ones particularly like California and, and Arizona, uh, where we've got massive prison populations, we're really starting to learn that lesson the hard way now. Uh, and so that's the big discussion, is how do we ratchet that back, um, but do it in a way that you know, is uh, befitting of, public, you know, of, of the interest of public safety. And also competitive corrections. Uh, Vanderbilt, you know, and that's basically privatization in a fancy word, but um, Vanderbilt did a study about uh, two years ago that looked at states that, that had all public monopoly correction systems versus states that have a blend of public and private prisons. And what they found was that all this, that if, you know, if you look at all the states that had the public and private blend, that they were saving about 15% on average uh, relative to the others. Um, so, you know, it works. You're, you, you know, prison privatization, I, I cover that issue. I can't tell you the kind of myths and scare stories I've heard. Um, you know, and it, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it has to be done with lots of care and due diligence, but it works. Uh, that's why it's around um, 30 years later after it got started. That's why it's, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of population in the United, prison population in the United States in private prisons is increasing, although it's only up to like 8%. So it's not, you know, we're not in danger of, uh, having the private sector take over our correctional system. We're nowhere close. Um, so there's a lot more room there. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Um, let, me, let me go back here. Just, you know, this is a question that I always get, which is, well, where can we, where, where can we look at privatization? What should we be doing? And literally, um, I saw one list in a book that was, uh, I think it was 400 services that have been privatized successfully in state, local governments, federal governments, all around the world. So the list is literally endless. This is just like, you know, the ones off the top of my head. But the real, so, you know, the real answer is that's not the right question. Where can we apply it? The question is, where can't we apply it? And, you know, ver uh, like I said, I mean, there's literally very few things um, that cannot be outsourced in government. You know, and of course, those are going to be obvious. Policy making, uh, budgeting, you know, some of those very, you know, those inherently governmental pieces. Um, you know, and you might, we could argue about safety. Um, I live in a town in a town called Fountain Hills, Arizona. We still have a private fire department. And I'm not talking a volunteer fire department or anything like that. I'm talking a private company, Rural Metro, who started the fire privatization business out in Scottsdale 40 years ago. Um, they, it looks, walks, smells, breathes, looks like your traditional fire, uh, you know, local government uh, fire department, but it is entirely run by the private sector. Everything is owned by the company, it, uh, and they are actually one of the highest performing fire departments in the, in the state. Um, so that's just another example. And even within those things that people think are sacrosanct, like you know, police or fire or things like that, um, 
even within that, even if maybe you, you're not comfortable with the service itself being privatized, they have payroll, they have accounting, they have HR, you can go down the whole list of things that are support functions for that service that you can look at privatization. But Jeb Bush, you know, I think gave the, the best answer, you know, and he said, you know, somebody asked him, well, what, he, well, for backstory, he came into office with a big privatization agenda and actually achieved a lot of it. Um, and when they asked, somebody asked him what he wouldn't privatize, uh, he, you know, he, this was his answer. You know, police functions, um, meaning the police power functions of the state, um, you know, offices of elected officials, decision making, you know, legislative activity, of course, those things, policy making. But outside of that, there's really not that much. Um, there's not that much that government does that corporations don't do in a lot of cases. Um, so, and you can see the results here. He actually used, you know, competitive sourcing. It's another term for privatization. Um, he used it over 130 times, saving, uh, you know, well over a half billion dollars and preventing billions in, in future costs. So, you know, and, and when I, this is what I was saying earlier is that, well, how do you make it work best? So you're not dealing with somebody's idea of what a good privatization idea would be. Um, so you're getting out of intuitive decision making and into sort of analytic, you know, fact-based decision making. This is what we've learned from around the world, uh, both, you know, it, it, from the UK primarily, because that's where they've done a lot of this sort of thing. Most people would be fascinated by the amount of stuff that's privatized overseas that we think is governmental over here. France, of all places, France has entirely privatized its equivalent of the interstate system. Most people would never, most people, A, had never heard that, and B, can't even fathom it. Um, there are things in the UK there are laws that require things like trash services and vehicle fleet maintenance, things like that, to be contracted out in local governments. You don't have the discretion. The federal gov or the national government says you will privatize these. These will be competitive functions. We, you know, and we think that we are sort of the bastion of free markets here in the U.S. But what I can tell you is that in terms of governance, at least, um, we've got a lot to learn because I mean, these places, these socialist countries, are actually moving better on privatization in a lot of cases than we are. Um, and you know, there's a reason for that, is because they're socialists. They were socialists. So they had to figure out how to make privatization work and kind of you know, make it, because when the, when the obvious folly of the socialist system started to dawn on them, you know, they had to figure out how to make it work to get out of it. And so that, they had to actually really pursue these things aggressively and in a very politically difficult way that you might not see here. So that's why you actually have more robust privatization models overseas, because they had to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, but the idea here is have, you know, instead of you know, having it be uh, intuitive-based decision-making, have a decision-making body, a center of excellence in, in privatization, you might call it, um, where you have a core group of officials that can you know, understand performance-based contracting and you know, good RFPs. How, do you get a good, how, do you, you know, how can we get away from the boilerplate RFP for a service that we're looking for and get into something that, where we want creativity? You know, it's those sorts of things that governments lack. And that's the kind of thing, if you had a centralized unit that could have that expertise to share with all the agencies, or they could come and use this as a you know, sort of best practices center or clearinghouse, that's a you know, powerful thing. And in fact, um, oops, I didn't put another, I have, I have another slide on this I didn't include here, but Florida actually has a great model of this. They call it the Council on Efficient Government. And you know, when I mentioned that Jeb Bush was a big privatization advocate. And you know, of course, though, uh, the privatization can go well or it can be tricky and you know he had a couple that got tricky uh, some major IT initiatives billion plus dollar IT initiatives that started to really go south they were you know the contractor was late you know it was costing more than they expected and you know all those sort of problems that came up and that start because of the scale of those projects and because they were involving the state's entire IT apparatus it got a lot of scrutiny a lot of media scrutiny and, and you know Jeb Bush said hey you know what instead of doing the sort of political dodge that you might you know kind of expect from policymakers um, what he did was that he was actually very honest and said you know what you're right as a state we're bad at procuring and we're not good at monitoring the procurements either so to that end I'm gonna create this uh, center of Excellence, and they called it the Council on Efficient Government. It was created in 2004, and it essentially serves as sort of that engine in state government for privatization, so that you know that, that you have consistent standards that are going on statewide. So, for instance, one thing that they do, uh, they are required to do business cases for any proposed outsourcing initiative. <clears throat> what that means is somebody has to do an analysis to look at all those sort of cost savings and impacts and all those things that um, could come out of it before you make the decision to do it. 
um, which is something that's notable and it doesn't happen much in public policy. Um, and so that's something that, in fact, I've written a model legislation um, that took that model and, you know, uh, that other states can use and can run it. Because, um, you know, Florida has a great model. I gave it a little bit, a few more teeth in a model bill that I created. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in that right now. And it's, it's neat to see that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that you want to have something, you know, to get to that question of, well, what can we or can't we privatize? One of the functions that this entity can serve, they don't do this in Florida, but in Utah, there's a similar entity that does do this, um, which is let's look at everything government does and let's categorize it, A or B. Is it inherently governmental in nature, meaning only government should do it, only public employees, or is it commercial, i.e., is it in the Yellow Pages? And that's the, yellow pa the famous Yellow Pages test, if you've ever heard that. I think that term is credited to uh, former Indianapolis mayor and uh, current Harvard professor Stephen Goldsmith, who you know went into he really reshaped Indi Indianapolis's government and uh, privatized some 40 or 50 different services while he was in office. And he called that the Yellow Pages test. If it's in the Yellow Pages, government doesn't need to be doing it. So let's compete that. And that's very simple. It's it's a no-brainer. Last thing here, and I'll go through this quickly uh, uh, for time. Uh, I, I, want, I know you guys have to get back to work. So the last thing is, you know, it should be so obvious, but it's not. Stop digging the hole deeper. Um, so the first three here are just a couple of things on the employee front. Simple things that are really not controversial even, and a lot of states have done bits and pieces here. First, I mean, stop hiring people, okay? Stop today. If, uh, in a, I, you know, I hear the president talking about uh, putting some sort of freeze on federal spending, um, which I think is, you know, window dressing for just bad fiscal decision making. But you know, if they want to really be serious, what they would do is say, at the same time, we're going to stop hiring. Because right now, the federal government is expanding, and I've seen the projections anywhere between 250 to 600,000 people over this four-year period in the current administration that will be added to the payroll in the federal government. And at the same time, they're deprivatizing lots of stuff that, was, that had been contracted out during the Bush administration. And I'm not saying that every one of those was a good privatization. You know, I mean, that, you know, you, you have to go, that, that's a case-by-case -case basis. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that um, you're not going to really do a good job of restraining spending if at, the same if at the same time you're talking about restraining spending, you're in massively increasing the size of the federal bureaucracy. Well, let's have a hiring freeze. And the beauty of the hiring freeze is that in government, there's a natural churn. There's, I've, I've seen estimates between like 8 to 12 percent attrition every year. So if you just stop hiring and let it and cap it there, stay there, you're going to naturally draw down by attrition. Now, of course, that's, attrition is going to rise and fall depending on the economy. I'd imagine it's a little bit lower today than it was two years ago. But still, that's the norm in government. And so, um, you know, and then if you, can, if you can keep that hiring freeze and then look at those positions that may be already out there, and if you haven't filled it, and six months is just a number, three months, nine months, 12 months, whatever you want. If you've got a position that you, you've got open, you've got budgeted, and you don't have anybody in it, it's obviously not that critical. Cut it. Get it out. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, you've got these insane benefit systems and pay scale systems. I was, I was in Baton Rouge last week and one of the employee, state employees there, I was asking about how, the, how their pay increases work. And she told me, she's like, well, the governor just, um, the governor just shot down a, a merit pay um, proposal. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound consistent because I, I know Governor Jindal very well and it doesn't sound consistent. And then it turns out the reason why he, he got rid of the merit pay, which is, you know, the idea is higher performing employees make, you know, get a little more of a bonus, right? Um, well, when it turns out, the way the system worked is that they have, it's like, it's like a child's uh, report card, like A, B, C, D, practically, except I think they're numbers, one, two, three, four. And you're, if you're a public employee, your manager ranks you as one of those numbers in terms of your performance. And if you're a two, three, or four, which are the highest categories, you get an automatic like 4% increase. So it's like you've got this veneer of like uh, some system, but the reality is that, you know, everybody gets a pay increase except like the, the ones who get ranked a one. And I guarantee you there's very few of those, you know, because nobody wants to rank anybody low, um, you know, self-esteem and all that. Um, so, you know, th so that's why he vetoed it and they, what they're trying to, or, you know, uh, that's why he rejected it. And, they're, and he told him to go back to the drawing board and come up with something that actually rewards performance. I'm not saying that's easy. And I don't, uh, you know, this is not easy stuff in government. But it, y you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. And corporations can do this. Government can do it too. 
Um, obviously, no, no new or expanded entitlement programs. I mean, if you just look at the federal level, right now we're spending about 60% of federal dollars on you know, Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and then you know, the other benefits uh, programs and entitlement programs. Um, but those are the big ones. 60, and it, you know, the projections go out to by 2050, that's going to be the entire federal budget. No defense, no, no anything, you know, if we just went on the path we're on now. So, you know, states don't operate that much differently. Granted, states don't have that big of, a, of you know, entitlement programs, but no more spending. Also, you need a um, sunset review process for agencies, boards, commissions, meaning things that pop up have to have a shelf life. Um, the problem in government is, that I call it the dust bunny problem. Um, we create an agency, we create a position, we create a commission, we create this or that, and they become immediately, the second that's passed, they're the next dust bunny that accumulates on the floor that you have to kind of, you know, walk through to get to something, you know, sane budget process or something. That doesn't work. You have to have, you know, in lots of states, Texas, Arizona, have uh, sunsets for agencies, and then also for other, you know, uh, commissions and boards and all these things that take lots of energy and spend money and get very little out of it. Um, consolidation of programs, obviously. Um, asset inventory and divestiture is another one. Uh, most governments can't even tell you what they own. If you said, hey, guys, uh, you know, city X, how much land do you own? Nobody knows. Nobody's ever done the map. Nobody's ever done the analysis. Um, Georgia's actually done some good work in this regard at the state level in terms of moving the ball forward on the inventory piece. But the next piece is, well, okay, so we own all of this. What can we get rid of? And, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second on a, a case study in Louisiana. And then obviously you need to tap the private dollars that are out there for new infrastructure and whatnot. Um, finally, you know, and this I put in bold because it's such a big thing, but the pension and the post-employment benefits that those reforms have to start now. Got to start shifting from the or from the defined uh, benefits to the defined contribution plans. So that's kind of a picture of the budget toolbox. Let me tell you who's doing something like this. Okay, and I'll make this fast. Um, so I've been working in with Governor Jindal's administration now, and kind of watching close up on and somebody who's actually trying to get this right. And I can tell you, given the level of crisis out there right now, the fiscal crises in states. I'm surprised that more aren't doing this, but Governor Jindal and the legislature there, to their credit, are really going aggressive. So the first, one of the things that they did is they created a commission on streamlining government. You know, what are those ideas? Let's get the big, you know, the thinkers at the table and get these ideas out. Well, they came out with their first report last month. Uh, actually, the final just came out earlier this month. Um, 238 recommendations that are, they're estimating would save a billion dollars um, through a variety of privatization, streamlining, consolidation, and elimination proposals. And you can go to the website there, com search Commission on Streamlined Government, you can find all of them, and there's some good stuff in there. I just pulled out a couple that kind of theme back to the things I was talking about earlier. Statewide spending limit is one of the recommendations. The pension reform, another one. Uh, the student-based budgeting, the, you know, that whole charterization idea. Those are just three. There are dozens and dozens of things that came out of that. They also have a parallel commission looking at the post-secondary uh, education system and how to restructure and rejigger the colleges. On privatization, they've got a number of things underway. Uh, in fact, I've worked with them on all of these, um, developing business cases and doing the you know RFPs and getting the thought process out there. Um, but first, creating a state competitive sourcing program, which you know is what I was talking about earlier, a center of excellence, all that sort of thing. Um, they're they're privatizing. These are things that have just gone out to RFP in the last three months. Um, risk management, their claims management, and loss prevention. Every state you know has its own self insurance. Um, states don't really need to be in the self insurance business or the insurance business. Um, building maintenance, that's actually an idea they ripped from Georgia. Georgia has some great innovative stuff on building maintenance uh, in, the, in their secure site facilities and corrections and juvenile justice and uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And Louisiana basically took that model and ripped it and they're trying to do that for dozens of their state buildings. Um, IT support services, rental cars, vehicle fleets are a huge money drain. Uh, and I know Georgia's made some progress there on that front, probably more to do. Um, but you know, in Louisiana, they said, hey, you know, let's get, all, let's get rid of a bunch of state vehicles and up our rental car contract. So instead of going to the motor pool to get a car, we'll go to Enterprise. And for 30 bucks a day, we have a car. Um, other things that are bigger, developmental disability centers, state-run psychiatric hospitals, you know, big, bigger systems are on the plate here. But then that's just, the, those are just the ones that have come out uh, in the last three months. There's a bunch in the pipeline. And then the Streamline Commission recommended a bunch more. Employee group med medical benefits, uh, correctional food and pharmacy services, uh, highway maintenance, uh, road maintenance, just like the building maintenance, uh, highway design and, and engineering stuff. 
Um, and then the last here, some other pieces here. Uh, every state has protected silos of spending. Usually, um, they made some, they passed law to undo that. So they basically, you know, they can make the cuts where they need to, even in the stuff that's painful, um, because they didn't think it was fair to make it, the rest of the budget, you know, bear the brunt of cuts while giving education and healthcare a pass. Um, They've, you know, they, they did the hiring freeze and they started that sort of uh, employee management piece. They've already eliminated over 3,000 job positions. 70, over 70 uh, inactive or just super, superfluous uh, state boards and commissions. Uh, they've started on civil service reform. They've got a civil service or civil service commission that's coming up with, um, you know, the next steps on pension reform and, um, and also the merit pay and all that. State performance, that's something that they had started. The performance system, now they're, they're beefing that up and actually trying to get into the, the, the details and the nitty gritty of how do we, what are the outcomes we're trying to measure. So they're taking a very simple one that the previous administration set up and starting to make it more robust. Um, Outcome-based budgeting, the, 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 you know, the, the, the priority-based budgeting thing I showed you with the, from Washington State. They've got two agencies now that are piling that. It's their Health and Human Services and their Division of Administration. Uh, they've got the national guru who kind of invented that. Uh, and, and tried to impl implement that in the Clinton administration. Uh, they've got him down there working with the agencies, you know, on the ground level to do this stuff. And so, you know, what does this mean? Why are we talking about all this? Well, the bottom line there is that just through making the, this set of moves, and there's more, this is just a slice, Louisiana was the only state that got an, a credit upgrade this last fall. Fitch didn't increase anybody's credit rating in any of the states except Louisiana. Why? Streamlining. That's it. That's what, the, if you go read the, the report, the Fitch uh, release, that's what it will tell you is that they trust the fiscal responsibility and the, the moves that they're taking right now. That's powerful. Upgrading a bond rating means you're saving money right off the bat. For the next time you go out to you know, borrow money, you're going to spend less in interest. And that saves taxpayers money directly. So they're already saving money, and lots of this stuff is you know, just getting underway. So with that, I, will, uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. We're running a little bit late, so we'll go ahead if you can stay for yeah. questions a little after, afterwards. Um, February 11th is our next event, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. We're adjourned. Thank you.